Without any further ado for this conversation about um, now legal marijuana here in Michigan, here's the host of 1A, Joshua Johnson. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Hi. So thank you for making time for us. I'm Joshua Johnson. I'm the host of 1A. And on behalf of WAMU 88.5, a service of American University in Washington, and NPR, thank you for making time to be part of a conversation that we think is very important. Communities like Detroit tend to get a lot of attention when something is wrong and not a lot of attention when other stories happen or just for everyday conversations about the things that matter to this community. Hopefully tonight's program will be the beginning of breaking that trend in the way that the nation talks about Detroit and about the state of Michigan. So just the fact that you are here means that you are part of changing the media narrative about this great city. So thank you for being here tonight. That is very important. Thank you for being here. Tonight's program is one in which we want to follow up on the passage of the recreational marijuana measure that passed in November. We have a panel of four guests who will help us with that conversation. Okay. Everybody ready? Yes. Yeah. Everybody ready? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. So, in 2012, Colorado and Washington were the first to legalize recreational marijuana. States up and down the coast followed. But what about the Midwest? Well, Michigan answered that question last November. It became the 10th state to legalize recreational marijuana, or adult use, as it's called here. Now, that law was different than similar initiatives in other states, partly because Michigan included a mandate for the state to have quote, a plan to promote and encourage participation in the marijuana industry by people from communities that have been disproportionately impacted by marijuana prohibition and enforcement and to positively impact those communities, unquote. So what might that look like? Who might benefit? How far along is the state in developing and implementing that plan? Now, those are some of the big questions we're asking tonight. We need your help, too. Your input is part of our elections project called 1A Across America. We've teamed up with member stations like Michigan Radio to explore what election issues Americans are focused on where they live. And in Michigan, that has included marijuana. It's been talked about at the state level for years. Now some of the Democratic presidential candidates are thinking about how to tackle federal prohibitions. But tonight, we're focused on marijuana in this state. Joining us here on stage at the Wright Museum in Detroit is Andrew Brisbo. He is the executive director of Michigan's Marijuana Regulatory Agency. Andrew, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Appreciate being here. Antoinette Jamison Safo, better known as Q. She is a co-founder of Botanic, a medical marijuana provisioning center in Corktown, and she supported legalizing adult use marijuana. Q, welcome. Thank you. Also with us is the Reverend Horace Sheffield. He's the executive director of the Detroit Association of Black Organizations. He has advocated against legalizing marijuana here in Michigan. Reverend, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. And Barton Morris is the principal attorney of the Cannabis Legal Group. He also campaigned for legalization. Barton, welcome. Thank you, Joshua. Most importantly, we want to hear from you. If you have a story to tell about how marijuana has affected your life, positively or negatively, if you have questions about the new law, what it means for you, for your family, for your neighborhood, perhaps someone you care about is behind bars for marijuana possession, whatever it is, write your name and your brief question or comment on those cards and hand them to our volunteer. Raise your hand with the card, we'll collect it, and please do indicate if you would like to read your comment or question on mic or not. Barton Morris, let me start with you. Let's lay some of the framework for what brought us here tonight. Talk about what you have seen in your years of defending people with marijuana-related charges here in Michigan. What are they usually in trouble for exactly? Are there certain demographics of people who tend to be targeted more often? Paint that picture for us. I've been practicing law in the state of Michigan for 20 years now, and that entire time representing individuals prosecuted, arrested, charged, and jailed for, uh, for criminal offenses. And for that entire period of time, I've seen countless numbers of, of, of times where those that have been, uh, that have been arrested for marijuana, simple, nonviolent marijuana related offenses. And it's unquestionable that a majority of those individuals have been uh, minorities and those that are, are not Caucasian. Uh, they have caused criminal convictions to be placed on their record that has definitely kept them from being employed. 
uh, not only misdemeanor convictions, but felony convictions. And especially in an age of medical marijuana, where people are doing nothing more than growing marijuana in their homes uh, for, for medical purposes, uh, or even recreational purposes, being in possession of marijuana, not hurting anybody, a drug that is widely known to be much less dangerous than alcohol, which is readily available, uh, it is it has literally ruined lives. And unfortunately, and it continues to do so because those people that have been convicted, they still are convicted today in the state of Michigan. There's nothing that's been done in order to reverse those convictions or move those things off of people's records, uh, which and st there's still people serving prison and jail right now. And so that, that that's what I've seen. That's my experience. So why did you ultimately decide, Barton, to support Michigan's recreational marijuana measure? Be I assume because of some of the cases that you've seen. That's the biggest reason. There's, there's many, uh, but the biggest reason is, is that uh, not only because it has uh, been proven to disproportionately affect uh, minorities, to, to there's increase not only in the number of people, minorities arrested, but even their sentences are more severe, despite the fact that others are similarly situated. Uh, it's, a, it's just that it just doesn't seem right where alcohol uh, causes so much death and destruction in our society, yet a, uh, a compound, a drug like marijuana, which is is just so much, I wouldn't say better, it's just, but, it, but it's a recreational drug, very equal to, mar to, to alcohol, that should not be putting people in jail. That's the number one reason why I, uh, I supported the legalization of recreational marijuana. Reverend Sheffield, you spoke out against the ballot initiative to legalize marijuana last fall. What was your main reason behind that? Well, I think it sends the wrong message to uh, people in our community um, who already struggle for employment, already struggle to hold on to jobs. I understand Barton's uh, point that can be accomplished through um, uh, decriminalizing uh, the possession of marijuana, doesn't have to make it legal. I also think, as was the case in a recent other uh, ballot initiative, that often our community is used as pawns. I mean, the whole notion uh, of people not uh, you know, going to jail and, and just a whole host of other things was marketed in our community and I think uh, quite frankly that uh, many other people are going to profit off of our pain. To be perfectly transparent with you, I've been clean 32 years. Marijuana was my gateway drug um, and I've seen how this drug has ravaged lives. The potency of marijuana that's going to be legalized in Michigan which can go up to 95% THC content uh, which is different than when I was Woodstock era or you know much younger um, all those things cause some concern. Plus, I work in the mental health area and I've seen people who have had psychological or psychotic incidents uh, from smoking marijuana. And uh, so all those are, are some of the main reasons why uh, I oppose it. We also know, by the way, that in Colorado, where it's been legalized, that the actual number of, of, of criminal offenses among African-American males has risen, not decreased. Yeah. You mentioned that Marijuana was your gateway drug. Right. I'll elaborate on that a little bit. Like, well, how, I mean, what, what was the gateway that it took you through? Well, I wound up, I wound up being a cocaine addict, um, short term cocaine addict. Um, I was in the entertainment area, you know, I managed Billy Paul um, on the road sometimes with the Temptations, and those are things that they did. And for many years, I resisted cocaine, but I finally did. Six months later, I was in treatment. But the fact that I smoked marijuana for all those years made it easier for me to transition into that. Now, everyone doesn't do that. I think the, the numbers are somewhere in the neighborhood of about 25% of the folks uh, who smoke marijuana subsequently become addicted to something else. But again, I think it sends the wrong message to my community. Areas, and there's also not as strict requirements for eligibility when it comes to capitalization and financial ability, along with some lower barriers to entry related to criminal history as well. We did get a comment from Tracy from Madison Heights. Tracy, if you would like to read your comment on Mike, you can make your way down stage right, and I'll get to you in just a moment. But Barton Morris, in terms of addressing some of the past issues with communities of color and marijuana, the ballot initiative didn't include any language with regards to <coughs> erasing past convictions. Michigan's governor, Gretchen Whitmer, and the attorney general have said publicly that they'd work to address this. Give me your sense of what you think needs to happen and how confident you are that it will happen. 
What needs to happen are uh, on, many, on a couple different levels. First of all, there are those that have historical convictions that are marijuana related and there uh, can be broken down into misdemeanors and felonies because growing marijuana is a felony. It could be just one plant and there's people that have convictions for those types of that for felonies for that. Uh, and then there's just misdemeanors for just being in possession of marijuana. I know and I do believe there will be something done about, about at least the misdemeanors, but a lot of people have uh, concern about the felonies. Who's going to decide whether which felonies are deserving of uh, expungement or, or setting aside those convictions and which ones are not? I think it's necessary for the governor to get involved in order to uh, facilitate a program where uh, perhaps the Department of Corrections can, can do something, user commutation power and, and or, and or uh, pardon power in order to do something about it. And I don't really, haven't seen any really movement in her office in order to do that thus far. I know that there are some legislators that are, that are interested in doing something and we're waiting for the introduction of a bill that may address it, but I'm not entirely confident it's going to really satisfy what really needs to happen. There's people that are convicted of felonies that are precluded from entering into the industry uh, and, that, and that's simply not fair, uh, especially those that uh, are minorities uh, and, and they deserve to be minorities and, and, and those that are, are not Caucasian have been uh, so disproportionately disadvantaged by cannabis prohibition for the past 80 years, it seems it's just simply unfair for them not to be able to to participate in the industry that we have. And it's also not fair that the communities that they're coming from don't have the ability to to benefit from uh, the positive things that a facility can have within their community. Most importantly, the decrease of a black market. Before we get to Tracy from Madison Heights, Reverend Sheffield, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. That's part of, as I understand it, the thought process behind this ballot measure to both change the legal structure and allow for African Americans to be part of this industry, mm -hmm. considering that African Americans have been vastly disproportionately prosecuted across the country for cannabis-related offenses. Do you think that perhaps this could help to, even the scales is the wrong term, but to try to address some of the social inequities that have happened in the past? Well, that certainly was part of what was marketed and the reason we had an overwhelming number of people in our community supported this, uh, although we just heard from my, my attorney here that that's not been codified yet. So uh, expunging people's records uh, and all that is yet to come. Um, I just want to say one thing, you know, everything is legal is not expedient. Uh, we still have to deal with workplace usage and testing on the jobs. So because it's legal doesn't mean that they're not um, punitive measures that can be taken by uh, your employer and those kinds of things. And again, when you're talking about justice, when you're talking about remediation of things that happen to us, we're far more likely to be put in that kind of category. And I just simply think, by the way, I want to also say I want to bifurcate that I was never against medical marijuana. I have uh, people in my family, for example, I've had cancer, I've never smoked it because I certainly don't want to relapse. Um, that's one thing, but to make it legal uh, for young men and young women in our community who are already at a disadvantage in terms of employment and those kinds of things and the, uh, the uh, imposition of the criminal justice system, which is not going to be a beta, it's actually increased in Colorado, are part of the reasons that I'm against this. So, uh, and I'm glad you mentioned that, the distinction between medical versus recreational. So right. I just want to make sure I'm hearing you correctly. Yeah. So from your perspective, and I don't want to relitigate the ballot measure, but from your perspective, there's a difference for communities or states who want to legalize for purely medical reasons as opposed to just making it available. Making it available for recreational use, which is what happened here. Uh, and let's also talk about the participation of African Americans, my good friend here, who I used to love to watch on television, she probably is in a better position to benefit from this. And I know what the initiative said about minority participation, um, but we've had difficulties with professional football players uh, being able to get licensed and have to go through subsequent hoops to do that. So the reality in terms of this <laughs> empowering people of color to become rich and to participate in this is a really questionable enterprise. By the way, you did make the comment about Colorado. Before we get to Tracy and then Q, I'll come back to you. We did a quick dig and we found a reference from the Chicago Tribune with regards to what has happened in Colorado. That state's Division of Criminal Justice last year analyzed the effects of its legalization of retail sales of marijuana since that went into effect five years ago. According to the Colorado Division of Criminal Justice, teen use had not gone up, but hospital visits 
and fatal accidents associated with marijuana use did go up. Crime has gone up in Colorado since legalization in 2014, but it is unclear thus far if those were correlated or causal. Those statistics from the Colorado Division of Criminal Justice. All right, let's go to our audience. Tracy from Madison Heights, you had a story you wanted to share. Tracy, what's on your mind? Uh, sure. Um, okay. So I... Tracy, if you would get right up close to that mic. Yes, sorry. Um, I'm kind of an unusual person who got into cannabis. I didn't actually start until I was 28. Um, and the reason I took so long was because of how nervous I was about it. And I wasn't really sure how it was going to affect me. Um, but it helped me with a lot of things I didn't even realize I had at the time. I have PTSD and it really helped me with that and managing it. It helped me with really, really bad period pain that's incapacitating and you can't really do anything. You feel like you're dying. Uh, and then the biggest thing that was really shocking to me, uh, when I was 22, I had mononucleosis in college and it really derailed my sleep schedule. As soon as I started smoking, all of a sudden it was back to normal. And it was the strangest feeling at first. I didn't understand what was going on. But as it continued to be that way, I was like, wow, I can actually sleep now. So, hey, Tracy, I, thank you for sharing that with us. I'm sorry you had to go through all of that to make this discovery. It sounds like if I could just follow up on your story, the uses that you described were mostly medicinal. What's your thought on the recreational use of marijuana? I think that recreational is perfectly fine. To be honest, you look at recreational use of alcohol, and it's far, far more devastating to communities. In fact, weed usually suppresses people and doesn't really get them, you know, they usually fall asleep or they go, you know, have fun with somebody. They don't really go and do cause havoc or any problems. They usually just fall asleep. Yet 50% of women who use medical marijuana self-report using it for anxiety. So we have a lot of people who have issues that are not being addressed because it's only medical. I would like to people to have the option to come into a provisioning center like ours, talk to a trained professional, and learn how they can take some plant-based remedies or some plant-based substances to make them feel better. Michael from South Lyon, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, yeah. is in the audience. You had a question that you wanted to share. If you would make your way to the mic, we'll get to you in just a moment. But Andrew, I wonder if you could just talk us through, particularly with some of the changes that your office has had to go through after this measure was passed in November, some of the overlaps or differences in terms of the way that Michigan has regulated medical marijuana versus recreational marijuana. Are there certain parts of the law that fall away? Does this new law just kind of stack on top of the existing laws with things like personal protection orders and so on? How does that interface work? So I think in a lot of ways, the new law will stack on top of the old law. We expect to see a lot of the industry participation on the medical side carry over to the adult use market as well. And we're trying to set up a regulatory atmosphere that supports that and allows for businesses to operate in both markets without having to adhere to two different standards. Now obviously when anything is passed in the law, we have to adhere to that. So in those, in those cases, a facility that wants to operate in both markets will have to uh, abide by the stricter standard between those two laws. But one of the major components, our focus in implementing this new program, despite the tight time constraints to have it up and running, has been outreach, education, and collaboration. So we've really wanted to understand what stakeholders in this nascent industry here in Michigan uh, want to see us do uh, in our role as a regulatory agency. So we've held work groups in Lansing and in Detroit and up in Marquette, way up in the UP, in order to understand what the perspectives are for people who are operating in the medical market. The UP, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Right, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, yeah. yes. Not everybody knows about the UPERS, I just want to make sure we're clear. <laughs> uh, but we needed to understand the perspective of people operating in the medical market, those who want to operate just in the adult use market, what patients' needs were, uh, hear from public health professionals, law enforcement, understand all of those perspectives when we're implementing this so we can do it in such a way that businesses can succeed and we can preserve safe consumer access to these marijuana products. Could you also, Andrew, before we keep going, just clarify the different kinds of people or entities that have been affected by these regulations? As I understand it, there are licensed facilities, there were some that had operated unlicensed, there are also caregivers, people who were kind of able to, freelance is the wrong word, but they were operating without kind of the same legal strictures. Can you explain that a little bit? Sure, so it, the 2008 law provided uh, 
a, an opportunity for patients to qualify and, and become a registered patient, as, as Q alluded to there. And they could either grow their own marijuana products or they could designate a caregiver to do that on their behalf. And a caregiver could provide those services for up to, 12, for up to five patients, 12 plants per patient. What grew out of that between 2008 and 2016 was a more retail commercial industry that was operated either through a, a lack of understanding or enforcement, and in some cases even through municipal authorization. And the 2016 Act that required us then to start regulating commercial facilities didn't specifically address how to deal with these facilities that sort of pre-existed under those conditions. And we provided a pathway for those businesses to qualify under the new act and continue to operate in that capacity during the pendency of their application. And that caused some, some unforeseen bumps in the road as we moved through to a fully regulated market and bringing them through that process. And we continue to work through that now. We are here at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History in Detroit as part of 1A Across America in collaboration with Michigan Radio. We are speaking with Andrew Brisbo, Executive Director of Michigan's Marijuana Regulatory Agency, Q. Jameson Sarfo, a co-founder of Botanic Medical Marijuana Provisioning Center, the Reverend Horace Sheffield, Executive Director of the Detroit Association of Black Organizations, and Barton Morris, the Principal Attorney of the Cannabis Legal Group. I'm Joshua Johnson. This is 1A. It is Uper, right? I said that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Because I don't need that angry tweet. <laughs> Michael from South Lion, you had something you, and I will get them. I will get them by the thousand. Michael, come up to the mic. Save me, man. What's on your mind, Mike? Um, my question for the panel is, um, who came up with the funding breakdown for the earmarked tax revenue that was on the ballot proposal, and how did they come up with their estimate? Good question, Michael. Barton, can you help with that? I can't. I can't tell you how we uh, came up with that, uh, but what I can say is that, that many other states, uh, they impose excise taxes that are significantly higher than Michigan has at our 10%. And with those higher excise taxes, it causes the price of the cannabis for the consumer to be considerably higher, which also puts it in more competition for a black market. So if somebody uh, is in the black market, uh, can get and purchase cannabis for considerably less, then it will proliferate in the black market. And that's one of the most important things about having a regulated, uh, taxed, uh, licensed uh, system. So that 10% excise tax, we'll see how well it does, but I think it's, it's going to significantly reduce that black market to ensure that people are encouraged to visit uh, licensed facilities where they can access and receive safe uh, marijuana. Michael, could I just clarify, are there any particular aspects of the funding breakdown that were most concerning to you, that you were most focused on? Were you just asking in general? I'm just wondering, like, kind of how, how you see this affecting you, perhaps? Uh, just a general question. I know other states have passed this proposal similar to ours before, so I don't know if we're basing it off their proposal, you know, how they came up with their estimates as well, or we're doing our own kind of thing to determine that information. Well, Michael, thank you for sharing your question with us. Let me get to another question from Esha in, from West, West Broomfield. Esha asks, my friend has a felony record since 2002 for possession of marijuana. She's been denied employment that pays livable wages because of her felony. Do you think she should be eligible to obtain a license to sell or distribute marijuana? I'd love to hear from Q and the Reverend on this one. What would you say, Q, to Ash's question? I would say absolutely she should be allowed to be a part of this industry. If, if it's legal now, if, if we have uh, John Boehner and Harold Dean who are now and be, be getting involved in this industry, yes, people who, that was almost 20 years ago and she's still being affected, she deserves a chance to be in this in, in this industry. And that, unfortunately, I mean, there's a, a, a huge story here, there's a, by the name, there's a story here about a man by the name of Earl Carruthers. And, and he is also someone who is in, in the similar situation. So he actually had um, a dispensary, a provisioning center, and so he's no longer allowed to be in this in this industry because of felony charges. So yes, we have a lot of rights, wrongs to right, and and that would be a start. It's it's frustrating that we are operating a provisioning center, and you have people who have been caregivers for the last 10 years who know this plan, who know the the uh, the benefits of it, and we can't hire those people. You know, we have to hire people who may or may not know the difference between THC or CBD, which is basic. So 
Yes, we, this industry would benefit from people who unfortunately are being held back because of felony convictions. And cue for those who don't know, what is the difference between THC and CBD? <laughs> THC and CBD are two cannabinoids, one of about a hundred that make up the cannabis plant. THC um, helps alleviate pain, but it also gives you that cycle of activity. CBD is becoming more and more known for its other medicinal qualities, but it's a potent anti-inflammatory. It's uh, stronger than steroids, and um, it, it has a, a myriad of uh, medicinal benefits. Refer Without getting you high, it's non-psychoactive. Uh, it's not difficult for me to, to advocate for justice with respect to the applications law and still be against uh, the legalization of marijuana. Uh, we've already heard that even though the things that were promised, expungement and, and, and uh, the decriminalization of all this is still part of not even uh, public policy as it relates to the implementation of this. So I think, yeah, people, if it's going to be legal, people who have got caught up in this legal quagmire in the past, should have their records expunged. Um, but that is yet something wait, waiting to happen. It's not even uh, being fast-tracked. We have a one-year process by which we'll determine uh, who will be able to operate, what those requirements are. But yet the same kind of thrust, the same kind of uh, passion and concern that was used, by the way, one of my main issues, you know, just solar energy, same thing. You know, no, no utility bill. Uh, they use us to flock to the polls to vote for these things. Have a provision to suggest we're going to have minority participation uh, when we know the cost of this is going to be out of the limits of most of the folks I know. But yeah, this should be certain something that should be done post haste, and that should be as much a part of what my good friend that I talked in the back with uh, considers as well. How are we going to undo um, the legal jeopardy that folks find themselves in? now that this is legal. Just to follow up on that, Reverend, is, is expunging people's records the only potential benefit you might see from this push toward recreational legalization? Are there any other pluses at all that you could contemplate? Well, you know, for, first of all, I'm against, I'm against the, uh, and I, I'm funded by Troy Wayne Mental Health Authority, so I do SUD programs, and it's interesting, a negligible amount of money is going from these fees for that. That's the recognition that there's some folks who are gonna need some prevention and treatment Otherwise, the money wouldn't be going there. Um, but, you know, brain function has been proven. National Institutes of Health has proven that brain function is affected. I'm in the process of applying for a drug-free community grant right now. Just got the data back from my community with two schools of K-8. through And over 50% of those kids in the 7th and 8th grade have smoked marijuana more than once or twice a week. That's a staggering number. Uh, and so, you know, I just, again... Uh, I wish everybody well. I don't want you to do well with your business and, and all that. But my, my position is that this is something that ultimately leads um, to the harm. And I want to say something else. May not that may not be as palatable and pleasing to certain folks. You know, I know people who are trying to go in this business, and just because they're black, that does not alleviate my concerns. I mean, you know, we we've had black folks who've made money off of our pain and poison in the past. So you know, getting rich off of of something that we know will harm some people, um, you know, and I have a lot of friends of mine who, uh, some of whom are dead, who began smoking marijuana. Barton Morris, I wonder if I could follow up on that last uh, line of thought that the Reverend shared. By the way, Ashley, you have a question for Andrew that you'd like to share. Ashley, if you'd make your way to the mic. Barton, I think it can't be uh, overstated that there is a perception among some about the link between people of color and substance abuse, that there is a certain propensity, and that there's a connotation, there's a stereotype out there, there's some negative images out there. One of our audience members alluded to this, to this in a tweet. The listener tweeted, I guess if you're uneducated, unmotivated, poverty trapped, in a declining region, i.e. the Rust Belt, staying bent is better than being all agitated about the man keeping you down. <laughs> So what's your question? Are you saying that more African Americans and more minorities are addicted to drugs and alcohol? Does that really have anything to do with the reason why we're legalizing marijuana, which is to keep those individuals from being arrested, or, or we're trying to protect society by, by ensuring that they're not uh, subjected to uh, felony convictions and arrests? 
I'm quite certain that the, the Reverend would agree uh, that one of the things that we're most uh, enjoying right now is the fact that they're no longer being jailed and in prison and, and, and maybe even more available to get the treatment services that are necessary in order for the real, that real particular problem to be addressed. Legalization of marijuana is necessary in order to, in order to eliminate, not only eliminate that, but to, uh, to provide the, the, the motivation to eliminate the black market. See, if we don't, if we don't legalize it, there, there will be and has been a black market. We've had medical marijuana here since 2008 without a regular, regulated commercial system. And you know what happens in that period of time? An explosion of black market activity. I mean, and, we, and it's taking a significant amount of effort and time and resources in order to, to, to get that back under control. Oh, no, I, I get that. I do understand that. But I, I also see where the reverend is coming from. I mean, we know that African Americans are disproportionately affected by all manner of controlled substances. We know that African Americans are disproportionately prosecuted and arrested and detained, and just because the law says it's legal doesn't mean that every police officer on every street in Michigan is gonna pay attention to that. And we also know that African Americans have less access to drug treatment services, or drug treatment services that are at the highest level of care. And I hear the Reverend saying that this could just be asking for more trouble, even if, you know, I don't mean to preach, but there is a Bible verse that says all things are lawful, but not all things Everything are lawful. Everything is legal. But can I add one quick thing about one, that? One, one, one second. I want to give Martin a chance to respond, yeah, and I'll come back to you. But uh, what so, about that? The potential for this, just because it's legal, to kind of open the door to another legal thing that could end up being harmful for black Michiganders. Are you saying the argument, or perhaps you're saying the argument is legalizing marijuana will make it more... Uh, used and, and it'll proliferate its its abuse. I don't think so. It is already being abused. That teens are abusing it. Children are abusing it. By making it legal, it will actually decrease the amount of access that children will have to it because it'll make it more difficult for them to get it when there is a significantly reduced black market. And that same thing goes for. Uh, mentally ill people that are not supposed to, to be having it. It's it's being sold uh, recreationally at a at a dispensary that is licensed and regulated. That is what's best for uh, for the industry. That is what we do with alcohol. And that is what's best for not just the industry, but for society, for our voters, for our for our for our state. That's what's best for for uh, to address all of these issues. Reverend, and then we'll try to get to And I think I think we can accomplish that without the absolute complete legalization of marijuana, um, we can decriminalize it so that people don't have the sting of penalty of a criminal record. So some of the stuff that you're concerned about can be accomplished without necessarily making marijuana legal and available to everybody. We can just decriminalize uh, the actual offense itself. But it doesn't eliminate the black market. Decriminalization, well, then where, where is everybody going to get it? Because there's going to be a demand for it. We're not going to eliminate the demand this for it. So if we, if, we, if, we just, if we just decriminalize it, then we don't have a, a safe uh, place to get it like her, like her provisioning center, then it just proliferates the black market to the point where it becomes so uncontrollable that it's a way bigger problem. It has to be a regulated, regulated system. Director Brisbo is, is, is doing very good work in order to ensure that there are good licensed operators and hopefully there'll be a program that addresses the particular issue of the lack of diversity that's traditionally associated with these types of, uh, uh, with this industry in our country. Before we get to Ashley's question and then QL, I promise to let you jump back in. Andrew, could we just get a clarity for people who are not in Michigan about this? Does this measure that passed in November decriminalize marijuana or does it legalize marijuana? That, those mean slightly different things. Which one is more accurate? I think it's more accurate to say it's legalized. I mean, we, we are providing now a <coughs> lawful mechanism for commercial cultivation, processing, and sale of marijuana products. So it, it, it reduces and eliminates uh, certain criminal penalties for activities and reduces uh, penalties for other unlawful acts within, within the, uh, the ballot measure. But I think legalization is the, is the appropriate terminology in this context. We got another question for you, Andrew, from Ashley. Ashley, what's on your mind? How will the new Michigan Marijuana Regulatory Agency try to allow caregivers and small business owners to stay in the market with now large business um, and campaigns as well that come along with that um, coming into the market? Um, and also, Another question to add to that is, um, 
consumer safety regulations, when will the process actually be permanent for these entities, um, for everyone involved? Yes. Andrew? So our, our program is intended to provide uh, the criteria for baseline entry into the industry. Uh, and, and that is agnostic as to the size of the business in many aspects. It's really just about whether you can meet that baseline criteria. We don't make qualitative assessments of, of eligibility because there's no cap on licensure. So anyone that meets that criteria is able to enter the business. On the adult use side in particular, we have specific carve-outs for small businesses. Uh, now the eligibility restrictions for many of the license types, which are in the law, so we're forced to implement those, are restricted to those who are licensed under the Medical Marijuana Facilities Licensing Act. But it does open the door for any Michigan resident to apply for a micro business, which is intended to be a small business option, where they can grow up to 150 plants, do all the processing and all the sales. So sort of a standalone operation, as well as the small grow operation. I think those are opportunities that are particularly geared, uh, if I were to speculate on the intent, toward the caregiver market to allow them a mechanism to get into this market. Additionally, the qualifications for eligibility, and more specifically the disqualifiers that are in the statute on the medical side, as Q was mentioning before, there are some pretty strict standards for eligibility to become a licensee that were within the law, and there are pretty strict standards as to employees who can work in facilities on the medical side. Those don't exist under the ballot initiative, so that will open the door in a lot of respects to uh, eligibility to become a licensee as well as to work in a facility. And we, we are going to change that. We just look at who meets that baseline criteria. So I think those opportunities will exist. And there's also a social equity provision in the ballot initiative as well uh, that we're implementing with a, with, a, with a focus on those communities that have been disproportionately impacted. And a lot of our outreach and collaboration with community members and stakeholders has been how we appropriately identify those communities and how, what we do, what we offer those individuals who represent those communities as it relates to getting into this new market. Glad you mentioned the social equity aspect of this. Margo is here tonight. She has a question about the social equity parts of the law. Margo, if you would make your way to the mic, and also Shelby, you had a question. If you would make your way to the mic. Q, I know you've been waiting very patiently to chime in. I'll let you make your point. And if you wouldn't mind, I'd also like to hear your perspective on the small business versus large business aspect, whether or not you feel that there are big competitors out there that you have to kind of work around or, or, or outthink or reckon with, or whether you feel like you've really got a clear shot in this in this industry. But let me let you make the point you've been well, waiting to make. I'll answer your question first before I forget it. Um, right now, it's too hard to say. Because right now, you have, I remember being on, on phone calls, conference calls with the group that was drafting what ended up being Proposition 1. And, and, and trying to figure out how, how, first of all, it's supposed to be three types of licenses and no stacking. You know, so the, the, the most plants that you were supposed to be able to grow was going to be 1,500. Then by the time it was all implemented, all of a sudden license stacking is, is, is now a part of it. And so that took a lot of people in the grassroots community by surprise. What, like, what do you mean by license stacking? Well, the licenses are class A, B, and C. 500 plants, 1,000 plants, or 1,500 plants. Um, you can now stack class C. Um, licenses, so you can you can get ten Class C licenses and grow fifteen thousand plants. Um, so that creates a huge business like, <coughs> compared to someone who maybe wants to just plant five hundred or a thousand plants. So all of a sudden, you now open the floodgates for big business to come in, and that's going to be a, a challenge for someone who wants to grow a hundred plants if they have to compete against someone who's growing ten thousand or twenty thousand or a hundred thousand plants. So I don't know how that's going to work. It's, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out because as I've been looking at other places, other states, I don't know if anyone has a market where you have two, a two-tier system like that. I'm not sure. So that's, that's my, my, my question about all of that. But I wanted to circle back on the um, cognitive function issue that the <laughs> Reverend brought up because I'm, I'm someone who is cognitively disabled. And I, I left my job because of memory loss. And I take, cognitive, I take cognitive tests every year. They're eight hours long. And I want people to know that, yes, if you are under 25 years old, the studies show that THC can be detrimental to a developing brain, and your brain is developing until you are 25. After that, cannabis, THC, CBD, the cannabinoids in this plant have actually been shown to improve cognitive health. Um, health. And if you were to look into some, um, some research, there's a fabulous researcher out of The Ohio State University by the name of Gary Wink, 
and he is doing lots of research with this, and he has shown the, the amazing antioxidant effects of this disease when it comes to brains, and they have the, the scans to prove it. So if you are someone who's dealing with cognitive issues, cannabis may actually be something that will help you. I know there is this, there is this myth or there is this, this uh, picture of, of you know, people, and you, you may lose your train of thought in the, in the immediacy, but overall, long term, cannabis has been shown to actually improve cognitive function. Margo, you had a question that you wanted to share, and then we will get to Shelby, or Shelby? There's Shelby. Let's start with Margo. Margo, what's on your mind? Hi, yes. My name is Margo Runner, and I am the co-director for the Michigan Cannabis Industry Association. I was also part of the Proposal One campaign. And the portion that you read at the beginning of, about social equity was indeed part of the approved initiative statewide. However, social equity is executed at a municipal level, largely. Um, and in this particular city of Detroit, there, there has been um, a silence around social equity. There's not a large push for social equity for both uh, political reasons. Um, it, was, it was opposed, the proposal was opposed by the church community, and the church community is largely connected to the political community, and for that reason, there has been very little education or any push whatsoever for this particular community to participate in social equity. Um, and so I, I did want the Reverend's perspective on that. Um, we've written it into the law, but how do we apply and provide opportunities for people who are interested in this community? Well, I, I'm not certain that the, the church's support or uh, uh, opposition to this uh, battle proposal is stifling uh, people who want to participate. I know a lot of folks who want to get involved in it. I think it is a political process, and I don't want to get too far off track but it's probably symptomatic of what we see going on overall in our city in terms of who's participating in economic activity. Well, I think that, you know, there's some other avenues that you should go through. I mean, churches don't control that much. If you're really interested in entrepreneurs being involved in this, I know that they used to work for me. She's into it. There are folks out there trying to do it. Um, the barriers need to be eliminated so that they can. But you're not going to get church folks of pastors to, to support that. No, I'm not asking that pastors support that. I just know that there, there is a, a relationship between the political community and the church community in, in the city of Detroit. And, and there has not been any conversation, any so are you suggest, are you suggesting that the church around the subject. The pastors have influenced the political leaders not to uh, avail this opportunity to, to the black well, community? Well, the, the NAACP ran a campaign saying this was crack weed and this was return to the crack epidemic. Right. So, so I don't think the people were. But the NACP to... is not the church. That's a nonprofit. My nonprofit did not support it as well. Yes. But I'm saying is that their Booker T. Uh, Washington Business Association and all kinds of other black business associations out here, you should work through them. By the way, I should know that we did invite NAACP to the event tonight. We didn't hear back, but that invitation yeah. was outstanding. I should. They, they didn't want to be the only person like me that was against them. Well, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of people. Where Margo's coming from, though, I mean, black churches are a political power center, have been for a very long yeah. time. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's yeah. gotten yeah. me yeah. I, I, I am interested well, in how that overlaps, because black churches historically are a political power center. They're also, as you know, one of the leading political power centers in terms of social equity. So I can see how for a number of ministers, maybe not in Detroit, but just in general, this creates an interesting kind of tension. You know, you want to be able to advocate social justice, social equity. This is a measure that was designed in part by the proponents to do that. But as a pastor, like, you know, I, I, I get it. Like, I see where that tension could exist. Yeah, again, as it relates to people getting in business, that's a whole different, different, different avenue. Um, my concern for equity or for the social justice into this is that everything that was said to our community to get the bulk of people in our community supporting this, by the way, African Americans overwhelmingly supported this, should come to fruition. Uh, there should be participation uh, by African Americans and, and, and women in our community in the ownership of this. She's already mentioned to you how things have changed. The perception is that the very wealthy are going to be the people. Um, there's been some speculation that some folks who well, I mean, there's, some, there's a lot of, of, you know, people out there who are putting uh, aggregate uh, interests together to own multiple enterprises, uh, which is 
what capitalism is all about. Uh, but again, as it relates to the church, you know, yeah, I'm a pastor, I have some political influence, but that would not stifle, it would seem to me, people who generally want to invest in this. So you just have to find a different avenue. Barton, I see your gears turning. Let me let you chime in and then we'll get to Shelby. I know for a fact that in the city of Detroit, the church community is responsible to ensure that the facilities that are licensed in the city were further away from, from religious institutions and from, from liquor stores. They didn't use that influence, political influence, that they definitely have to ensure that there is a place for minorities uh, and, there, and, and for, for people in this industry, the minorities in this, to be able to, persist, to participate. I agree with what Margot says, is that it's much easy, easier to have these municipalities to enact something to ensure that there's minority participation and diversity within the, within the industry, and it's much harder for the state to be able to do it. So I, I agree that there has been political influence uh, that has been exercised by the church community. Shelby, why don't you come up to the mic? You had something you wanted to ask about. It's on your, on your mind. Okay, so uh, the criminalization of cannabis has always been rooted in racism. Uh, the entire idea behind a war on drugs was created to criminalize, cri to criminalize and convict people of color. Uh, even the word marijuana in its origin is racist. Um, how do we break almost a century of the idea of the dangers of cannabis? Q, what do you think? I tell people all the time that change happens not necessarily on stages like this, but really in conversations. Um, small conversations with people. I, 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 I was very hesitant to come out of the cannabis closet, as it is called in this industry, um, because because of the, the the stigma. The stigma. I was terrified that people would say, "Oh, wow! I think that she was high when she was at work," because you you expect people to say things like that. Yeah. However, though, I'm, I'm proud that people could see that, wow, she's a functioning adult, yeah. and uh, she doesn't <laughs> seem like a weed head. Yeah. She seems like a normal, average person. And oh yeah, by the way, she happens to use cannabis, and I actually, thank you for bringing up the marijuana thing. I, I try to use cannabis as much as possible instead of the word marijuana. So I, I, I think that it starts there. Um, even I. I had many conversations with Margot and, and Barton when we were on, on the Prop 1 campaign and, and, and trying to, to we, we, we reached out to churches because we know that that's where our community congregates. And, um, and, and we said, okay, so we know we're not going to have the reverence, but we have the congregation. And, and, and the ballot showed that. So because we had those, but I'm, I'm appreciative that the churches allowed us to come in and speak to the congregations. And, and so it's like, come on in. And so we did. And, and when you start having those conversations, you know, my mom is 70 years old, my mother-in-law is 71 years old. If you come to Botanic, you'll see that our oldest patient is 94. You know, you have people who are tired of being in pain, who don't want to be on dialysis, and who are looking for an alternative, and so they come to our doors. And so conversations happen at that counter. Conversations happen over, over dinners. And so I say to my mom, Look, Ma, I know you're, you know, you're taking 90 units of, diet, of, of, of insulin a day. Why don't I give you some CBD with a little bit of THC and see what happens? Well, now she's down to 15 units of, of insulin a day. When you look at our community, when you look at how these medical costs are, are impacting our, our families and how much, and I, I help um, a, a retired Detroit police officer who lost her pension in the bankruptcy and she was buying used insulin from her friends. Okay, Th those are the issues in our community. So when I talk to people say, hey, let's change your diet a little bit. Let's mix in a, a little bit of something that will not get you high, but will stop your pain. And then they see it works, and then they see they aren't getting high. My mother lives in Indiana, which is a, 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 pro, a prohibition uh, uh, state. Half of her church wants me to bring them CBD, which I will not do. Okay? I do not do that. So yeah, so so no, you have people want to know, and and they're afraid. They they have sixty or seventy years of propaganda in their head, and it's on us, the the people who have who are, are living this every day, to change their minds. It's not going to happen on a wide scale, but it's happening one conversation at a time. I know the clock is running down, but I want to get to some more audience comments. 
Jazelle is here tonight. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Jazelle, if you would make your way to the mic. Larry, if you would also make your way to the mic. In the meantime, let me read a few comments from some members of the audience. Nick from Flat Rock says, this can be an unpopular opinion with marijuana sellers and growers in regard to the pharmaceutical industry. However, my thoughts on the recreational legalization is that the more states that legalize, the closer we are to federal legalization. Once we reach federal legalization, we can begin more studies and clinical trials in regards to medical treatment for numerous ailments and diseases. A lab may be able to find a cannabinoid that we're not yet aware of that has the potential to cure cancer, epilepsy, or any other life-threatening illness. Another member of our audience who chose to remain anonymous, which is fine, wrote that he was a senior citizen, and Andrew, I wonder if you can answer this one. He is uh, in low-income subsidized housing, not allowed to smoke indoors or outdoors, and he said he does not have a way to get to a dispensary. Now that marijuana is legal in Michigan, he wants to know if there is a way he can access either medical or recreational marijuana. Do you know if that's provided for in the regulations or is that kind of a gray area? No, it is provided for. So in, in our uh, regulatory program on the medical side, we did provide an allowance for provisioning centers to conduct home deliveries. We have four facilities, I believe Q's is one, that was recently approved to conduct home delivery to a patient. I mean, that, the entire intention of those rules that we created were to provide an access point for people who otherwise couldn't uh, find their, their medical marijuana. Uh, we have some restrictions in the ballot initiative that, that make it a little harder to do home delivery, unfortunately, but as I said, we intend to roll that program out and have some comparable allowances there. But we just started issuing those approvals for home delivery, but that is another mechanism by which people can access uh, medicinal products. All right, Jezel, why don't we bring you up to the mic so you can get your question. I believe you had a question about regulations. What's on your mind? That is correct. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my question is, are the laws, regulations, and compliance items and other uh, monetary uh, items associated with uh, the cannabis regulation, are they different for provisioning centers versus grow houses, or are they all encompassing? Are they all the same? Andrew? Largely, they're the same. Uh, most of the requirements, both under the medical side and the adult use side, deal with eligibility for licensure overall. Uh, that's one of the reasons as we set up the, pro the application process, we allow individuals to have their uh, criteria evaluated, go through the background check process in order to determine overall eligibility for licensure. And in many cases, operators want to uh, obtain multiple licenses, particularly to be vertically integrated where they can grow and process and sell as well. So almost across the board, the requirements for licensure are the same regardless of the type of license. Chazelle, thank you for sharing that question. Larry, if you would make your way to the mic, there is one question that I'd like to finish with, and I'll give you all a chance to start thinking about it before we have to wrap our conversation. This is obviously a ballot item that just passed. There's probably going to be more changes to the law that will shake out in the future. I'd love to know for each of the three of you, Barton Q and Reverend Sheffield, if there was one regulation that you could add to the laws in Michigan as they stand right now, what would it be? If there was one you could add, what would it be? Think on that for just a minute. We'll come back to you with that question near the end. But for now, Larry is at the mic. Larry, what's on your mind? I'm Larry Gabriel. I write the uh, Higher Ground column for the Metro Times newspaper. Uh, I've been most smoking marijuana since I was 17 years old. I graduated from college by high honors. And I got a master's degree with a 3.8 grade uh, point. Yeah, I only got a 3.4, Larry. <laughs> And uh, I wanted to address some things uh, Reverend Sheffield has said. One thing is that Proposition 1 did not promise expansion. Okay. Yeah, the advertising did. No, it did Most of the marketing that I was making. Just a moment, just a moment. One at a time, please. Larry, finish your okay. and we'll go to the rep. However, okay, my question is because you have uh, told us that marijuana is a gateway drug, I would like to know, did you use alcohol before marijuana? And also, do you consider alcohol a gateway drug, caffeine, refined sugar, tobacco, any of those things? Well, uh, I smoked marijuana before I, I smoked uh, alcohol. I, I don't take, I don't drink either alcohol or do I do drugs at all. So all of those, I don't I try to regulate my caffeine as well. By the way, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't law alcohol anymore than I do any other drugs. I didn't 
uh, say whether you used it or not. I was asking whether you considered those things gateway drugs. Well, Larry, what are you getting at in terms of the gateway drug argument? Where well, it's one of the arguments that uh, he has used, and I would uh, argue that all of these other things are gateway drugs, too, that these are things that affect your uh, mindset, your uh, body, your physicality. You give a uh, bunch of candy and cake and stuff to little kids at a party, and they all start running around and screaming. Yeah, because so, they want up, they want up with harsher drugs. Well, and, and that, that I think Larry is part of the, you know. Larry, I think that might be part of the counter argument. I mean, you know, sugar is perfectly legal, but diabetes is ravaging the black community. Right. So just because, just because it's legal doesn't mean it's healthy. I'm not saying it's healthy. I'm just asking, what, you know, what do you think of that as a gateway drug? That's just my question. Barton Morris, can I get you to chime in on this? <laughs> the, the whole uh, issue about a gateway drug is so much more complicated and convoluted than simply just saying use marijuana, therefore you're going to use something harder. People's environments, uh, yes. their yes. friends, yes. Their, their associations, their influences, uh, you know, there's so many more things that have to be taken into consideration. Alcohol is definitely a gateway drug, maybe yes. just as much as marijuana is, and so are every anything that anybody can be addicted to. But the fact of the matter is, is that just because you use marijuana doesn't mean you're more likely to do anything else. In fact, I think it's been proven that marijuana users will drink alcohol less. But yes. as far as the gateway yes. theory goes, uh, that's really just something that was made up to try to put fear into uh, a voter's mind and to try to and try to vote it down. Andrew Brisbane. Correct me if I'm wrong, some of the funding that is generated by this item goes toward prevention efforts, research efforts, and the like. Is that right? On the medical side, yes. Uh, some of the, the funding through the regulatory assessment goes to substance use disorder, uh, half a million dollars to the Bureau of Community and Health Systems for substance use disorder uh, facility licensing, and, and that, that money that's devoted to our Department of Health and Human Services is intended to be used for substance use disorder treatment and education programs as well. Q, what is your vision for your business? Where do you want Botanic to be five years from now? <laughs> Sold. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, I asked because, you know. I, I want it sold. Well, <laughs> I asked because, you know, African Americans have an extremely strong history of starting businesses, growing businesses despite barriers to entry. And I wonder, you know, now that this barrier to entry has kind of been changed by Michiganders, and now that some of these social equity issues are starting to be addressed, I wonder. Where is your, what's the goal for the next five years? What's your vision? The funny thing is, is that I got into this um, to start an edibles bakery. I still haven't started my edibles bakery. <laughs> a bakery? A, a ba for edibles, so to address the issues of people who cannot smoke or inhale cannabis. So um, I wanted to uh, develop an edibles line. Um, I'm hoping that five years from now that edibles line is, is um, not only launched, but hopefully nationwide. When it comes to Botanic, um, my, my vision of Botanic is, um, I don't want to say it's small, but I, I like to, maybe I consider it more focused. It, it's easier for me. And also, um, you know, my husband runs Botanic. I, I, I don't run Botanic, I, I, but I focus on the patients. And, and my goal, whether Botanic stays at its location, and the wonderful location in Corktown, or you know, it comes all over the state and all over the, the country, it's still just about that one patient who walks in who just doesn't want to be sick anymore because I was that person. So I don't know where Botanic is in five years, but I hope that it has left a legacy of people saying, oh wow, I had no idea that I've been lied to for the last 70 years, <laughs> and here is this plant that can make me feel better, that I can even grow in my house. Because when you when you look at, at, at Prop, Prop 1 and, and legalization, it wasn't just about commercial facilities. And yes. I, we, 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 we've kind of glossed over that. I, I um, and, and this was an argue, um, a discussion even in my, in my home, I, I believe that people have a right to plant and to grow this plant. So yes. even if you don't have enough money to, to spend $8 for some CBD caps at Botanic, which is how much they cost, <laughs> um, one of them, but you can grow a plant on your own. You can, if you can grow tomatoes, you can grow cannabis. Yes. And in Michigan, you have that right. And I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful that the, the voters of Michigan, the people who wrote Prop 1, made sure that the right to grow in your house is protected. So you will always have access to this plant, whether or not they're in the
I want to get to your hypothetical about adding a regulation in just one minute, but one last comment. Wayne wrote, or one last question, Wayne wrote on our Facebook page, I have concerns about municipalities that want to opt out of recreational use. Will those same municipalities be allowed to access the funds provided by taxing cannabis? Andrew, is there any provision for that? No, they won't. The tax distribution for the 10% excise tax is done on a pro rata basis determined by the number of retail facilities in the community. So there's 15% of the excise tax goes to the municipality, 15% to the county based on the number of retail facilities that they have. And one of the, the challenges with the provision of the adult use side that is different from the medical side is that we have to issue a license to a facility that applies unless there's a prohibitive ordinance. So I think a lot of municipalities that have opted out are doing so, uh, waiting to see what the state regulations look like to determine their next approach. So when they do, when they opt out, it's not a permanent stance. They'll be able to amend their ordinances later on. Uh, but I think their concern is that if they don't take some proactive action, when we start taking applications, their hand will be forced because it will be too late to do something then. And I want to follow up a little bit on what you said when it comes to the social equity provisions and what we're doing at the state level. Our main focus as we look toward how we implement that social equity program is for it to be something that's sustainable and really meaningful. I think a lot of states that have had those social equity components focus on how they can take individuals from those identified communities and get them access to the regulated market. We're focused more on how they can achieve sustainable businesses and also other ways in which we can encourage participation. It's more than just being a facility operator. Where, which is an expensive endeavor no matter how you look at it, regardless of the fees that we charge. Operating a business is expensive, especially in this industry where the effective tax rates are so high due to the federal stance with regard to marijuana. But we're also looking at how we can impact it through other mechanisms, how we can encourage participation, working with communities toward their ordinances, and also working with the industry operators on how they can provide other sorts of opportunities to get into the industry beyond being a facility operator on your own. Stepping out of character for just a moment, we're about to wrap up the conversation. When we do, we'd like to record a little bit of applause from you. So at the end, I'll raise my hand like this. That'll be your applause cue. Please keep clapping until I lower my hand, and then we'll let the guests go, and then class dismissed. <laughs> Before we wrap up, let me get an answer from Barton, Reverend Sheffield, and Q. What regulations would you like to add to this? If you could add one thing to the law as it currently exists, what would that be? Uh, briefly, Q, what would you add, if anything? I don't know if this is considered a regulation, but expungement, and this was a, a huge thing that was that was uh, talked about in the hearing conference. And, and I know that um, Reverend feels that, that it was promised. I, I, I remember telling people over and over and over again and explaining why expungement was not in this bill. It was because we could not attach two issues to one petition. And I explained that to people over and over and over again. It was a huge heartbreak for us that expungement was not involved. Reverend? Ditto. Expungement and Barton? I would agree with that as well, except I think that uh, we have to point out that the reason why Colorado had an increase in arrests after legalization is because most of those arrests came from people that were using marijuana in public places. We need social uh, use licenses in places where people yes. can use yes. it. Yes. Because a lot of people cannot use it in their homes yeah. and, and therefore they have no other place to use it other than on the street or in a park. We need to, just like alcohol, get it out of, of, of the public and allow people to have a place where they can use it safely. Yes. Barton Morris, the principal attorney of the Cannabis Legal Group. Barton, thanks for talking to us. You're welcome. The Reverend Horace Sheffield, executive director of the Detroit Association of Black Organizations. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you. Anquanet Jameson Sarfo, better known as Q, a co-founder of Botanic, a medical marijuana provisioning center in Corktown here in Detroit. Thank you, Q. Thank you, Joshua. And Andrew Brisbo, the executive director of Michigan's Marijuana Regulatory Agency. Andrew, thanks very much. My pleasure. This show was produced by Amanda Williams with special thanks to Mercedes Mejia of Michigan Radio. Thanks to the entire team at Michigan Radio and to the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, whose grant makes this project possible. We will return to Michigan soon for another 1A Across America event. But until then, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thanks for listening, and thanks to everyone for coming. This is 1A. <laughs>